One of my favorite models of behavior change is something called the trans-theoretical model of change. This is also called the stages of change model. What makes this model unique compared to some of the other models we've seen is that there's a temporal aspect to it. So it argues that people aren't all at the same place. And as far as our particular stage of change, we, we are very different. So for instance, some people are just in that stage of just like, I don't want to. That's like, it's kind of zero. <laughs> That's stage zero kind of in the stage of change. I don't want to leave me alone. You know, and then there's the people that are just like, yeah, I know I should. I just don't know what to do. Right. We would consider those two different discrete changes, uh, stages. And depending on the stage that a person is in, we are going to approach them differently. And our goal here as health promoters or part of our goal would be to help move people along the stages and towards ideally a stage of maintenance okay uh, however it's really important to note here that it's not over when someone reaches that final stage of maintenance as anyone who has a practice of physical activity knows you always have to kind of work on it you know you might have to do many things to stay in maintenance you know that's it, changing behavior is easy keeping that behavior change is often the the hard the harder part Okay? And it's important to realize also that people can relapse and relapse or like reverting to a previous stage. Please don't consider that a failure because behavior change is a process and it doesn't happen overnight. And actually failure is a critical and important part of changing because with every failure, and I don't even like the word failure here, but with every failure or like missing the mark, let's say you learn something and you grow. And ideally, you try to fix that thing that maybe stopped you or reevaluate and go in a different direction to help you get to where you want to be. Okay, so the stages of change model breaks behavior down into five different stages. So pre-contemplation, as I think of my friend Anthony, who's a smoker, and he's like, I love to smoke. <laughs> and he's just like, he does not want to change. He does not want to quit. He's not going to quit. He knows it's bad for him. He doesn't care. <laughs> so when people are in that stage, that's a hard stage. That's probably the hardest stage to go towards because what do you actually do? And what I would argue is sometimes we have to wait for that person to be ready to change and we can't force it on people as well. So one thing we could do in a pre-contemplation stage is, be, is raise consciousness and maybe health education about the dangers of smoking in this case or uh, like evaluating how his behavior affects other people. Um, maybe the person smokes or they drinks be because of other stressful things that are going on in their life and we need to relieve some of that drama that's causing that behavior. Perhaps they have no time to exercise and you know they have too many obligations at their home and like so they're just like I don't even have time to even think about exercising right so working at that stage it is more challenging but it can be exceptionally rewarding when someone moves from pre-contemplation into even the next stage okay so contemplation is just like yeah yeah I know I know I should quit and I like kind of want to quit smoking but like ugh, like I don't know if I can really do it I don't know if this is for me that's contemplation Right. So what can help at that stage is for them to start reevaluating themselves and kind of looking inward at what if they know they should and they want to, but they think they can't. Well, what's really stopping them? And again, like this is where maybe working one on one might be more effective, where we try to kind of get to some of the the underlying barriers. OK, and then try to kind of minimize those underlying barriers and increase those the the motivating factors or the self-motivating factors that might help them actually change okay preparation is like okay i can do this i can change i know i can okay so like let's make a plan i don't know how to do it a lot of people are like are here with exercise too like <laughs> like i okay i want to exercise more i just don't know how to i don't know how to run i don't know how to use the gym equipment I don't know how to do these things, right? Or they do, but they just don't know when to go or what's the best way. So again, working with someone that is skilled in this area can be very effective. So um, the two strategies they often recommend in the preparation stage is something called social liberation. So noticing and using social conditions that support personal changes. So for instance, if someone already has friends that exercise 
or um, there are, let's say, um, group coaching that is going on or social norms that are part of that particular behavior that we can tap into to help them kind of find that that guiding guidance towards, you know, engaging in that behavior. Okay. And of course, we can help people in the stage of preparation by helping them make a plan. If we are versed in that particular area, we can help them do that too. Self-liberation is just that last little that last little extra to kind of get them to the next phase, you know, this could could be a little bit about building up self-efficacy. Like, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. Affirmations can work in here. Mirror work can work here as well, where you like look in the mirror and be like, I am capable of doing this. Right. You're like speaking to your own consciousness in this case. OK, so these things can help get people into the stage of action and action is doing it. Action is I am actually exercising. I am actually I actually have stopped smoking. That is the action stage. OK, so things that can help in this stage is, again, having that social support, having the people that are like encouraging you or, for instance, I um, I've taken up a meditation practice over the past couple months that's long it's about 30 minutes to an hour a day and like in the beginning it was difficult because my husband was like well you're like you're just gone for an hour a day like it was kind of it wasn't really a helping relationship in the beginning but I had to kind of talk to him and figure out a way where that hour wasn't dipping into our own lives right and now now it's just kind of Part of my day and now it's just like he's like oh what time today are you meditating so now I've switched that relationship into a helping relationship and this can be difficult because when people are trying to change some people aren't helping and some people don't want them to change a lot of people want us to stay stuck where we are and that can be very frustrating for someone that's trying to change or for someone that's trying to help other people change okay so a reevaluation of the friendships and uh, environment that affect that behavior is potentially an important part here okay counter conditioning replacing the behavior with more positive behaviors and experiences okay so instead of so if we're talking about again, again smoking a counter conditioning could be like instead of going out for a smoke you know i do a walk around the block and then i pat myself on the back for that you know something like that okay and reinforcement management so rewards can also help with the action stage Okay, we are like, we like rewards, Think we're animals, you know, so animals like rewards. Dog does a trick, dog gets a treat. Humans do a trick, humans get a treat. That works for a lot of people. Although ideally we're building an internal locus of control where they don't necessarily need that treat. Okay, and then maintenance, like I said, I would argue that maintenance is the hardest stage. To stay changed, that's difficult. Okay, so one of the things that can help and many actual, all the things that kind of helped to get us here, right? All of these things, we keep reinforcing them, can help with staying in that maintenance stage. But so can things like environmental control or stimulus control. So for instance, as I mentioned in another module, like I was obese for about half of my life and I you know, have a very overactive appetite and I have to be very careful of what I keep in the house because there's certain foods that trigger that appetite. So for instance, Stimulus control for me is like not keeping the stimulus of ice cream in the house because I have zero control <laughs> when it comes to ice cream. Okay, so for instance, if someone's uh, just quitting drinking, we wouldn't want to keep a bunch of alcohol in the house in front of them. Right? If someone's quitting smoking, we would want to minimize their exposure to other people who smoke too. Okay. So don't worry so much about, well, this gives us a kind of an overview of this model as well, so you can read through as well, so this as well, sorry about the quality, but why I put this slide up as well is I like this concept in particular, the upward spiral. Instead of seeing this model as a linear model, it's not a linear model. People don't change like this and they just proceed through the stages and, oh, I'm done. You know, it's constant, often effort for people. Right. And people might go through and extra is a great example because people go through stages where they're like, yeah, yeah, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. And then they fall back into, let's say, contemplation. You know, that's not means they're a failure. That's part of the process. You can relapse at any stage to a previous stage. OK, but again, as health promoters, we would want to reframe that not as a failure, but as like a part of the process. That's just part of the process. Failure is part of the process. And every time you 
don't reach that particular goal or you fall kind of backwards, great, that's a learning experience. What do we learn? What, did, what, what was it about the way we approached this that wasn't working for you? What do you think would have helped you stay at that stage? Okay. And again, we work with the people to try to figure out how we can keep that spiral going upward and keep them in maintenance as much as possible. But again, with an understanding and a compassion for them that understands that they might relapse and that is part of just being human and it's okay as well. So what keeps coming up in this unit is this concept of barriers. It applies to every single model that we're going to talk about, that we talk about. So when people are thinking of participating in a particular behavior, there's often what comes to their mind first is what barriers there are in place to that behavior. Like they know they should exercise, they know they should sleep more, they know they should eat healthier. However, I don't have enough time to do these things. I have other things going on in my life. That's not, not something that I'm good at. I don't have the money for a good gym and then there's these other things that like socioeconomic status that have a whole complex set of interactions to again impose certain barriers to that particular behavior okay so with behavior change this is something that we can often look at with with the people we work with again to, regardless of the ecological level we work work at it's like what's stopping them and how do we reduce their perceived barrier, perceived barrier, to make it less of a perceived barrier, and ideally even kind of shift that into a strength. Okay, so for instance, a good example here is uh, meditation. I talk about meditation, and um, a perceived barrier to meditation is time. Right, about thirty to an hour, thirty minutes to an hour a day of meditation. This is freaking long time I'm just when I started doing it, I was like how am I supposed to actually do this <laughs> and what's interesting is that when I meditate for that long when I actually sit down to work I am more focused I am more like I just do better work so sometimes that barrier actually shifts to a positive you know physical activity you don't have enough time well if you are regularly physically active things are just going to become easier to you in your life, you know, and you might have, again, more focus to do the things that you need to do, right? So working with barriers is about trying to reduce that perceived barrier and then to make that person feel strong enough to jump over that barrier as well, to really make this seem so sexy that that person just is like, I don't even care. I need to jump over there. And again, working with that person is important to understanding them so we can tailor that in an individualized fashion. So an example of barriers and how we can affect them. So let's say someone has a bike, but they don't, they don't bike, okay? So is it their barriers around their attitude? Well, then maybe we need to kind of dig deep with them about their attitudes about biking and have them come up with reasons why it's actually a really good thing. We don't want to tell them things. We ideally want them to come to the decision themselves, right? Sometimes a barrier is super easy to fix and it's amazing when it's super easy to fix. Maybe it's because the bicycle's in the back of the garage and it takes too much time to pull it out. Well, can we move the bike? Can we make it easier to get that bike out? The bike has a flat tire. Okay, can we fix the flat tire? They live far from work. Okay, well, who says you have to bike to work? Is Can biking be how you go get groceries? Work with your people and figure out if we can start making a difference in how they perceive these barriers and ideally let them come to the realizations that they've made these barriers larger than they actually are and that they absolutely are capable. They do have the self-efficacy right to overcome these barriers 